Good evening, Grace Bible Church and Friends of Grace. Our passage from this last Sunday was from Jude chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Now, we gave our attention exclusively to verse 3 in terms of this particular passage because of the nature of the um, uh, role that it serves in the larger letter, the, the fact that it really constitutes the heart of the book and the, just the weightiness of it and the dynamics of it. And so I thought verse 3 would be um, a safe and good place for us to give our primary attention this last Sunday. But that being said, we did back up to verses 1 and 2 for a little bit. And that wasn't just for the advantages of reviewing and keeping a matter of continuity to our study, that we're not just isolating our attention to one small verse or one small passage at a time. So there is value to reviewing and having a refresher at the beginning of messages. But primarily, I had a view to the fact that when you have verse 3 and you, you recognize and identify it as the heart of the book and the, the, the very core of why he's writing and it's going to inform the rest of the letter, well, it's also helpful to recognize that verses 1 and 2 weren't to just get you there. It wasn't just that, well, verses 1 and 2 kind of warmed us up and it, we had a, a step or two and now we're engaging, but they were valuable in their own right. I would say they were extremely valuable to serve as a foundation for the letter. And we had things like Jude's identity as a slave of Christ and the fact that we also want to join a like identity, submitting to the lordship of Christ and the totality of our lives, our thinking, and our conduct. It's very, uh, very important, given the nature of the church, to contend for the faith. It's very important regarding the fact that those to whom we um, would find as an opposition to this effort to, to contend for the faith are the very ones who fail to submit to the lordship of Christ. We also... Um, drew from the fact that the beauty and the identity of our being called, specifically that we are loved by the Father and kept for the Son, and then even the, the petition that Jude has for them, that what we already have in Christ, what we already enjoy, namely mercy and peace and love, that it would be multiplied. That informs how we should view the nature of this call or this uh, charge that he gives us now in verses 3 and 4, primarily 3 and then the rationale is uh, worked out in four. So verse three is the heart and the charge. Verse four would be the rationale. And again, we gave our attention this week to verse three, which, again, having a view to its weight, it was, uh, I would say, a precious beginning to it, uh, referring to his readers, identifying them as beloved. So he's already given them a measure of identity, himself a slave, them being called um, the petitions that he provides for them, but then he sets that kind of uh, affectionate tone right off the bat. That I'm giving you a hard and weighty and, and, and important charge, but it's not just because of uh, uh, some strong form of leadership, or it's not because I'm going to demand your attention, but because they were beloved. He had an affection for them, and he had an affection for Christ, therefore he had an affection for Christ's church. And so he writes them with stating beloved. And then he tells them about his original intention for writing and how there was a, a firm shift, but there was a, a conviction, a drive, a desire to write about their common salvation. And we talked about the fact that, you know, we don't really know um, what that letter would have looked like, but one of the examples I gave was I went back to First um, Peter chapter 1, where Peter just really extols the beauty and the glory of our salvation in Christ and, and just drew out the fact that, um, if you want just raw gospel, you can go to Acts chapter 2, and, and Peter preaches at Pentecost, and he declares that which was necessary for salvation. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, he goes beyond um, the necessary foundations and just uh, really unpacks some beautiful language regarding the nature of our redemption and how to think about it. And, and so I, I can imagine that's likely of, um, of the like nature of that Jude would have would have desired to do here, writing them about their common salvation, because they clearly understood gospel truths. He was able to build on and speak with a, a affirmed uh, understanding that they, they had gospel truths. And so that being said, they were clearly was going to unpack something further here, which maybe he was in a subsequent letter, maybe he wasn't. We don't really know at this point in time. But he did desire to write about their common salvation. He had a measure of... Um, uh, conviction and char or desire behind it and so for that to be the case and then to say but I couldn't something else came up I, I had to redirect my attention that really uh, should alert us some that should draw our attention that he was here giving 
his focus and strength about something of, of precious value to him and, and a desire and maybe even a convictional drive, but he had to redirect. And so that tells us when you're redirecting from something very important and valuable, that whatever you're redirecting to has a, a certain urgency to it, a certain weight to it, uh, even in its own and in its own right, a, a, an importance and maybe even greater importance given the circumstances. And so he says that I had intended to write about our common salvation, but I felt the necessity to write to you, exhorting and charging and calling you to contend earnestly for the faith. And we talked about how that. Uh, the nature of that calling is a hard calling um, to, to contend, to wrestle, to struggle. Um, it, it takes something of you. It takes your time, your energy, your strength. It's going to have measures of sacrifice and loss involved. Now, the Lord will keep his own, but that doesn't mean you're not going to, to suffer and struggle under the weight of contending and fighting and wrestling for the faith. And so we also examined, um, well, uh, who might this kind of charge really be applied to? And so we looked at things like, um, who would be a good candidate? Well, Paul, so wouldn't he be a great candidate? He was mighty in the scriptures, and he contended uh, with the, the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And, and so he'd be a really great candidate. And then we looked at Paul and his charges to Timothy to fight for the faith, to contend, to oppose, to affirm, to correct, rebuke. Okay, Timothy would be a great candidate. And then we narrowed it to then the, the pastoral qualifications in Timothy and Titus with you know, the part of the charge of eldership and pastoral ministry is to, to teach and to contend and to correct. And, and so, well, the elders, that, that's clearly part of our responsibility and charge. But then we brought it back to the fact that it's hard, it's challenging, it will take something of you. But it wasn't just for Apollos and, and like men that were uniquely strong and gifted. It wasn't just for the elders, but rather it was for the church body. We, those of us who are in Christ, are called to contend, are called to wrestle and struggle for the faith. And we drew from the fact that, again, looking back to verses 1 and 2, if we're going to rejoice and say, yes, I share in that identity of being called, uh, salvifically, effectually called, and, and I share in that identity of um, being loved by the Father and kept for the Son, well, those are the very ones he wrote to, and by extension to us, and therefore, the charge would also apply to us, a heavy and a weighty charge, but a good one nevertheless. And, and with this, we talked about the fact that, you know, we read the letter. We read the letter in, in totality on Sunday. Just It's 25 verses. It's very easy to accomplish that in a, a concise time. But you, you cover it, you look over it, and you start to realize, here we've been called to contend for the faith, to struggle and to wrestle for the faith. But Jude never explicitly says what the offense was. But what does he do? Well, he, he unpacks the nature and character and the, the um, kind of the modus operandi, the offenses of the clandestine offenders. And then he goes on to give us charges on, on what we are to do in terms of our own degrees and um, reflections of faithfulness and then what we're to do for others. And then he finishes with the doxology. And so we're left to realize, wait a second, maybe that's how we're going to contend. And so with that in view, we realize that if Jude charges us, then Jude's going to give us what we need to know. And so um, with a view, again, to those things that we just covered, we, we realized and walked through that those that introduction and greeting, that did lay a foundation. A foundation for what? For the charge to contend. So we should draw on that, find comfort and courage from that. Then we have the actual call to contend itself in verses 3 to 4. And, and with that, you have the, the heart and the charge, but you also have um, the nature of... Uh, um, the, the offenders, um, he speaks to those who have come in amongst us. Uh, they've crept in unnoticed. And then he goes from there, verses 5 to 7, he provides us foundation for righteous judgment. And this helps us understand that the Lord will, he will righteously judge those who are denying the Lordship of Christ, those who are offending him, and those who are um, distorting the faith. And then we have the indictment of the godless invaders. And he draws from a lot of uh, passages and a lot of examples here. And then the surety of the righteous judgment, again, building off of what he's already established and off of the indictment. Then the charge to remember the apostolic warning. And then from there to keep yourselves in the love of God. The, so we have the, the attention on the offenders. Now the attention on us to keep yourselves in the love of God, verses 21, or 20 to 21. And then verses 22 to 23 to restore others in need. So attention to others who are in need of uh, rescuing and help. 
And then finally, the doxological conclusion, and we, we highlighted the fact that that also informs how we contend for the faith, as it is the a glorious culmination and expression of worship and how you worship and how you understand worship and the God that we worship all factor in into our to both our understanding of the faith but also our contending well for it. And so we see that, well, in one view, it may look like, well, he didn't address what the exact offense was or he didn't address certain details um, and, and for such a weighty and heavy charge. We also realize, well, he did. He provided us a framework. He provided us a framework to understand the offender's our responsibilities, and then the directing us ultimately to worship, all building toward this common dis, um, charge to contend for the faith. And so those are things we're going to work through as we continue our study. But um, just a view back once more to a few things that are, are helpful. Um, what is this faith, uh, this faith that was once for all handed down to the saints? Well, um, Faith is used in a variety of ways throughout the scriptures. And again, this is also not something he explicitly says. Let me go on to say what the faith is. Rather, he goes on to express, um, again, the offenders, our own conduct. So what can we draw from this? Well, the faith appears to be the um, body of apostolic teaching um, that was continued to be assimilated at this point in time. Some people would say, well, that impacts the dating of Jude. I don't think so. We have New Testament authors referencing one another. One of the most obvious and, and most near to us at this point in time was our engagement in 2 Peter chapter 3, where Peter talks about Paul writing scripture, writing of similar things that he also was engaging in. Um, Peter had an awareness to his own participation in writing in the scriptures and drew our attention to the apostolic teachings and the prophetic word. And so we have a volume and body of um, apostolic teaching that was already being established and continued to be established. Obviously, um, John putting the, the conclusions to that work. And so there was a, a body of truth for which they were to contend for, uh, contending in a way that reflected they understood it, and they knew it, and they loved it. They would correct those who were in error, restore those who needed help, strengthen those who were weak, and demonstrate faithfulness and part of that faithfulness again was to deal with as we looked here not just our foundation not just the call but to deal with those clandestine offenders who have done much harm we didn't know who they are and how they act and and like matters it's kind of a, an intelligence briefing as it were before going into combat and then finally our own charges to keep ourselves to restore others and to be driven to worship and again that body of apostolic teaching what do we how do we view it now? Well, we have the totality of the scriptures, both the old and new, and that's the faith for which we are called to contend for as well. So with this in view, um, what are some ways that we can be uh, thinking about response and prayer? Well, there's a number of ways, and the first one would be a carryover from last week. Um, I think that it's helpful, not just because we reviewed verses 1 and 2, but also just to keep before us, especially as they prepared us for this charge. So the first two would be Pray that we would faithfully pursue and clearly express Jesus Christ's lordship in the totality of our lives. And then also pray that we would see and appreciate Jude's introduction as an invaluable foundation for the forthcoming charge of contending for the faith, which again, we've now given our attention to. And so some new items of prayer that we would add to this. Pray that we would appreciate the weight and necessity of this call for all of us to contend earnestly for the faith. Um, this was a weighty call. Jude didn't just redirect for the, the sport of it or because he exhausted his material or thought of something else. This was a, an important pivot. And with that, also a weightiness to, to contend for the faith. And we need to, to evaluate it and value it accordingly and to, to respond appropriately. Pray for both perseverance and clarity in the execution of this call to contend for the faith. Um, again, it's, it is a challenge. It will take time and strength and effort and energy and measures of loss. And so we need perseverance. But we also need a measure of clarity. Um, sometimes we want more detail than the passage um, knows to be in our best interest because likely the variety and the, 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 the various expressions, uh, the various persons, all these things are going to be somewhat fluid, but they're going to have core consistencies. And so we have those core identities, which we can work through and wrestle through and, and see as they express themselves in various ways. And so we need wisdom to discern um, what does it look like in, in our respective context? What does it look like in terms of uh, the charge that we've been provided? And with that, to not be too quick to um, 
go after somebody that we're just in a disagreement with or that's also wrestling to understand and, and to grow in grace as well, but to rather know the nature of the offenders as have been laid out for us very plainly and then have a clear direction also just for our own drive to, to keep ourselves and also to have mercy on others. And then finally, pray that we would continue growing and maturing in this faith to which we have been called to contend. Um, if you're going to contend for the faith, that body of doctrine that has been passed along to us and now codified and canonized in the body of the scripture, then you need to know the faith. Um, you're not really going to be skilled or effective in defending that which you don't have an intimate and really comprehensive knowledge of. And that comes with time and effort and not just time, but time and effort. It's something we're going to have to work at. And so we need to pray that we continue to grow and mature in these things so that we could heed this call in a way that is faithful and pleasing to the Lord. So again, um, more concise in terms of our review because it was a very uh, brief expression or a very brief um, engagement of the text as it were, but verse 3 is a very important part of this letter. And so I think it was worthy of its own attention. Um, I'd encourage you to review the, the message as a whole if you have opportunity, if you weren't able to be with us. Um, but view it accordingly in terms of verse 3 really is going to shape the trajectory for the entirety of the book. And the call is clear. Now we're going to see the rationale next week as well as we're going to begin to see how it works itself out. So I would encourage you again, continue studying, reading, praying through these things. And for those of you who are um, part of Grace Bible Church, we'll be assembling tomorrow evening for our weekly prayer meeting, giving our attention to Psalm 119. The plan this week is to, to read through the totality of Psalm 119 once more and to, to be refreshed by the comprehensive engagement in which the psalmist expresses the Word of God and how that impacts our thinking, our conduct, our worship. And um, we're continuing to pray for Christ Church around the world. Our focus this week is in Cambodia, the Christ Church in Cambodia. And then we'll continue our study both in the book of Jude and the life of Christ on Sunday. So hopefully this is of encouragement to you and you will be strengthened in your own efforts to contend for the faith. Right, grace and peace to you all.